Hey everyone and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast where we seek to develop, inspire and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now here's what we've got for you today. Dave, welcome to the podcast. How are you, my friend? Thank you very much. And really nice to speak to you. Hey, you know what? It feels like a couple of days ago since we saw ourselves at the awards and I managed to, to share a couple of moments with yourself. Um, so it's no surprise to me that we once again find ourselves talking about supporting people with their development, trying to solve the challenges of the 21st century fire service. But how was your Christmas? How are you? And for people that are unfamiliar, just uh, give us a quick intro for yourself if you could. Okay, thanks very much. So, uh, yeah, Dave Etheridge um, had 32 years in fire and rescue. All of that was in Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue Service, did two years as an on-call firefighter. And then in those days, you couldn't transfer. So you literally had to stop one, apply and start the other. Uh, And then transferred into the whole time service uh, back in 1987 and then went right the way through that service and ended up being the chief fire officer from 2010 right the way up to 2017. And you know, I can honestly put my hand on my heart and say that I bounced out of bed every single day and I wanted to go to work. I absolutely loved the fire and rescue service. I loved what it did. I loved the people in it. I loved the difference we could make to communities and that kind of impact on young people. And for me, it was just a privilege to be part of that sector. And that's really now why here I am six years later, still very heavily involved with the sector, because this is about now putting back into the sector and into organisations that gave me so much over my three and a bit decades. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress. And we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. You know what? That's um, that's not as rare as as people sometimes think it is. Because I know some people feel 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 good, bad, the ugly, whatever about the emergency services as a whole. But the fire service in particular, you do tend to find, even when people have done 10, 20, 30, 40 years, they do tend to hang around the fringes of the sector. And it's I think I romantically like to think of it as a reflection of the fact that people don't just do this for the money. They don't just think of it as a job. It really, it's almost, a, a, my, my sister wouldn't forgive me if I said it's a vocation because she's a teacher and she always tells me what she does is a vocation, not a job. But I, I think the emergency services is, is quite similar. So you've clearly in somewhere or another managed to navigate your way through the landscape that is a development in the service. But one of the things we're going to mostly focus in on today is this concept of practice to progress. It first came across my radar maybe seven months ago, maybe maybe slightly longer what it, what is it where do you think it's sort of or where did it come from sorry and um how do you see it fitting into the uh, some of the jigsaw holes that we find ourselves in trying to support people with their development sure absolutely um i mean i think that the best way to describe practice to progress is that it's an absolutely unique partnership that's never been seen before in the uk frs so it's a partnership between fire knowledge that's the owners of fire magazine and also then women in the fire service and afsa two amazing organizations that have done so much to take forward various issues and to challenge various areas within the sector to move the whole sector forward in a more positive way so what practice to progress is is a unique partnership between those organizations and is really designed to do lots of things at lots of levels. The first thing it's there for is to help support individuals. The second thing it's there for is to help support organisations. And the third thing really that it's there for is to therefore help to improve the professionalism and the culture of the FRS sector so that our ultimate customer, the public, will have a much better service and will have organisations that culturally are much more aware of the communities that they serve, but also more importantly, you've got individuals that are confident and competent 
around the roles, around future progression, so that they can actually develop their career pathways and enjoy their careers just as much as I enjoyed mine. Now, the, we said that some of this came, or the some of the concept or the framework for this sort of came from the police, and that screams to me that we're clearly, I mean, we do this sometimes, actually. We operate in silos in services. We've gotten a lot better since the origins of things like Jessup and, and cross-organizational working and things like that, but it clearly says to me that we're not the only people facing these types of challenges. And I wonder if, if at all, you can kind of reach back and, and, and ask me the difference between, or sorry, explain to me the difference between maybe the challenges that you were facing because personal development and progression, um, coaching, mentor, and however we might term it, it will have existed in some capacity, even when, you know, in the seventies and the eighties and whatnot. But I wonder if the fact that we're doing so much turnover these days. We're seeing so many people naturally retire. We're seeing differences in the length of people's careers and people moving through ranks at a rate, which is sometimes exciting, sometimes worrying for some people. And how did people navigate, you know, progression and development back when you first started and, and, and why have we perhaps struggled to, I don't know, maintain that framework up until where we are now? Yeah. And I think, you know, all the points you raised there are really legitimate challenges and i think that if you asked 10 people those questions you'd probably get def 10, 10 different sets of answers because i don't necessarily think there's one issue here that's that's ever been uh, the big one that's either caused the problem or the big one that we need to crack to find a solution okay. you, you mentioned there about the fact that p2p has got its roots in policing so you know how have i got involved with p2p and why did I feel I wanted to help the sector within FIRE move forward with this exciting partnership? Well, I, a very, very good friend of mine is a gentleman called Alan Baldwin. He retired as the Deputy Chief Police Constable of Cambridgeshire Police. And like myself, Alan has been involved with helping to develop people all through his career. I first met Alan when he was a fresh-faced assistant chief police constable in Thames Valley, and I was a fresh-faced assistant chief fire officer in Oxfordshire, which is part of the Thames Valley area. And um, I found out he was a newly promoted assistant chief. We met up for a coffee. We got on very well professionally, and we've stayed friends ever since. And one thing that Alan was involved with was he was part of the assessment panel for what's known as SPINAC, which is the Strategic Police National Assessment Centre. That's done through an organisation called the College of Policing. And Alan was, to be quite frank with you, he was horrified about the quality of senior people in police moving forward to go through that assessment centre to potentially become assistant deputy and chief police constables. And not only was he horrified by the quality of many of the individuals, but what he also saw was that the vast majority of females that applied and the vast majority of ethnic minorities that applied were unsuccessful. And so he decided to do something about it. Mm. He set up practice to progress in policing um, now nearly four years ago. And over that four year period, some 4,000 police officers, including members of public coming into police right way through all ranks, over 4,000 individuals have been through that program the programs that P2P offers policing. And then when you look at the outcome of that, there's been a 50% increase in individuals at that National Assessment Centre who've been through this program, an 89% increase in the success rate of those going through the fast track program within policing, and 70% increase in individuals who have been successful in their local promotion processes. Yeah. So we know this works in policing and, and HMI, same as fire, they look at policing and, and they are complimentary about this approach as well within services. But more importantly for me are a few other figures, which is that those under representative groups that have been through this process within policing, 78% increase in success rates for black males, 43% increase in the success rate for candidates from other ethnic minority backgrounds, and a near 17% increase in the success rate for female candidates. Now, when I looked at this, and I really went into it in great detail, I thought to myself, well, do you know what? Not only is this something that the Fire and Rescue Service can benefit from, but also, particularly because I'm quite a competitive person, I reckon we can do even better than policing. 
around us. <laughs> That's why we formed the partnership with AFSA. That's why we formed the partnership with women in the fire service. And it's about taking all of that good work, welding it together with all of our experience, all of our enthusiasm, and then working with services to bring to life their succession plan. I mean, a couple of figures for you. I was talking to a couple of chiefs the other day and it suddenly dawned on me. I've been retired now for five, just over five and a half years. There's only three chief fire officers across the UK who I worked with five and a bit years ago. Wow. Only three left. That's bloody quick. Yeah. Now, I, I was saying like people are climbing the ranks really fast, but that is an astonishing, because what is that? I'm going to get this wrong now. Is the 49, 47? How many services are there's, there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, mid-40s. Mid I mean, if you include places like Guernsey and and then you look at kind of Northern Ireland, et cetera, et cetera, then you look at Wales. Lord, Northern Ireland's got loads in Ireland. They, they do it in a different I mean, structure, yeah. don't they? Yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah, near, near as damn it, late, late 40s, 46, hmm. 47 fire and rescue services. Wow, and only five. So when you look at that, there's the turnover... <laughs> It's just astonishing. And then I was talking to a couple of chiefs the other day and one chief said to me, 40% now of his workforce has been in less than four years. Another chief said to me, 55% of their workforce has been in less than six years. So when you look at the brain drain that's gone because of pensions and you know changes, et cetera, et cetera, you look at the, the demographic curve of the UK FRS now, there was a massive recruitment campaign in the 80s. Well, that massive recruitment campaign has now dropped out. It was a perfectly natural thing. We've now got thousands and thousands of new people coming in the job, which is wonderful. They can mm. enjoy the job as much as I did. But what we also know is that services are struggling with their succession plan. They're struggling with their people development mm. because there's so many capacity challenges. When you look at austerity, that occurred many years ago you know those hr functions were pulled back that additional capacity was pulled back focus very much on the front line whatever the front line is these days so this is about us now working with services to work with people from all backgrounds this is not just about a positive action thing it's not about ethnic minorities it's not about females it's about us being completely inclusive and in terms of our set of values working with fire and rescue services, working with people in that to improve their skills, improve their knowledge, but more importantly, improve their confidence to move forward, to practice in order to progress. And basically, that's it in a nutshell. I wanted to jump in and just speak to you about a real ugly truth that despite the fact we are trying so hard, we get way too many messages and emails about mental well-being and mental health. And I recently came across something I think is going to be a real game changer. It's called Genesis. Now, this is really different because it's actually human-led mental and social well-being. It's not just an app somewhere that no one's ever going to use. They provide human-led regular bite-sized approaches. I'm talking 15 minutes a time using language in a structured learning approach to create safe spaces for teams to have these conversations. And they've got a whole bunch of free workshops coming up online. First one is the 23rd of February, and it's built around sleep and performance with Dr. Martin Jones as a human performance and sleep specialist. You can find all this in the link to the podcast. Another thing I'd specifically say looking at is their 90-day program, which has been designed exclusively for well-being leaders in the police and fire and rescue sectors. It actually gives you some tangible tools to have these structured conversations so we can genuinely start to reduce burnout, absenteeism, and general poor mental health. It's not just a tick box, guys. So scroll down, have a look in the notes to this podcast. The first one is on the 23rd of February. I'm going to be there. And the reason I'm actually going to attend something like this versus other stuff is because it's human-led. It's actually going to be real people talking in a way that I can relate to and it's easy to implement with my team. So hopefully I'll see you there. Do you know what excites me though when I hear you speaking there? And there are some scary numbers, to be fair, when we talk about turnover and the change in workforce, both age, experience, diversity, and things like that. That is scary for some people because a lot of people just hear that we are hemorrhaging. We're hemorrhaging skills or hemorrhaging experience. But also the the sort of serial optimist within me says that, you know, when we speak about things like culture and we speak to things like traditions, when people say they're good, they're bad, they're ugly, whatever they are, because such a large proportion, such a large percentage of the workforce now has a shorter career or they have not been in as long. Ultimately, when we speak about culture, we are in the absolute precipice of being able to redesign that culture and make it whatever we want it to be. So people could moan about the culture 5, 10, 15 years ago, but whatever it is now is largely of our own creation. We are the culture. So when when I hear about 
um, change in our approaches and trying to make a more a more welcoming and more inclusive and more supportive emergency services as a whole. What excites me when I think about that is the fact that we can control all of those things now. Before, people would have ideas of nepotism and you know a fear of the the old boys club or something like that. Well, that that excuse is no longer going to be there. I think for so many people because we're also we're also new to this in in so many ways that for better or worse it's going to be what we make it so when you speak about let's let's kind of start maybe at the beginning when we look at that initial recruitment aspect because i know one of the initial or one of the frameworks as i as i look at the website before me is that aspect of initial whole time firefighter recruitment because that's gone through many changes in the past 10 or 15 years and it's been very successful in achieving some of the numbers. And when that reminds me, actually, when I speak about like women in the fire service, when people used to say that, you know, we weren't having success all these years, that wasn't because we weren't necessarily doing it wrong. I feel like, like you were just alluding to, that 30-year career length, roughly as it, as it was, has now come to an end. So I think we're going to start like having the fruits of all of that labor. Now we are seeing the real numbers change because all the work that we've been doing was working, but it's the fact that we weren't having large numbers of retirees and giving us an opportunity to demonstrate that our, our recruitment from a base level has actually significantly improved. I mean, what do you think when you look at, uh, let's start with whole time recruitment, I suppose. Um, how have you seen that change from when you joined? And, um, you know, where have we come to with it, do you think? Yeah, again, I mean, you know, many of the points you raised there are are just fascinating. I mean, if you were to look around recruitment, I think actually the UK FRS globally, you know, if you look at it as, as, as a collective, I actually think that many services have done fantastically well mm. in the last three to four years about changing the historic makeup of their recruits courses. You know, we now see many more females joining. We now see many more ethnic minorities joining. And actually, we're kind of just another employer, therefore, aren't we? You know, we're the same as most employment organisations now, which actually have said, well, you know what? Come and work for us. Not really interested in your background. Not really interested in whether you're an ethnic minority, whether you're female. We're not really interested in any of that because we're a totally inclusive organisation. And this is about getting the right people. Mm. And services have worked very hard at those recruitment activities around have a go days, the work of women in the fire service, the work of AFSA, all of these organisations have all been chipping away. And as a result of that, there's some incredible success stories out there now. However, we have got a real challenge at the numbers of underrepresented groups that are now moving forward for promotion. Okay. And we have got some challenges around the numbers that do that then fail and drop out. That's been recognised by HMI. It's been recognised by many services. So, again, this is what P2P is all about, is helping everybody to be better prepared for that next step, but also to be better prepared for the job that they're doing. Hmm. Now, you mentioned there around culture. You know, the fire service has been, again, on a pretty amazing journey. The you know One of the last things that I did before I left back in 2016, 17 was helped to set up the National Fire Chiefs Council and I've watched that go from strength to strength and now with the new chair of it in Mark Hardingham I have absolutely no, no doubt it will continue to go from strength to strength and you know that organisation has done so much if you look at the work of people like Becky Bryant and, and uh, people like Anne Millington you know really inspirational chief officers stroke chief executives that have worked really hard at creating that code of ethics now that's in the service from which is also um supported by the local government association you know you look at the work that Anne millington did around the national fire chiefs council leadership framework mm. leadership framework around behaviors around expectations at all levels it's not a fire chief's expectation it's all levels in the organization you know expectations around how a firefighter behaves expectations how a crew watch manager our non-operational colleagues it's a totally encompassing leadership framework fantastic but it's a document and we've got to bring that to life we've got to live it we've got to make sure that culturally organizations change and live those documents and again part of the the p2p approach when you look at 
everything that we do around supporting people for assessment centres, when you look at the work that we're doing around um, uh, working with some services now around underrepresented groups as part of there to give them more confidence and encouragement to move on in the organisation. Everything that we do, we cross map over to that code of ethics, we cross map over to the leadership framework and we cross map over to local services ethics and other frameworks that they use as well, because, you know, we recognise that not all services have adopted them in their entirety. So the foundations are there at the very top. You've got those big, big strategic documents at the very bottom. You've got much more enlightened people now joining the fire service. You know, when you think about the impact of social media, good, bad or indifferent, just look at what we're doing now with the podcast. All of this makes a difference. You know, if through the conversations you and I are having now, we can manage to maybe get 5% of people to think slightly differently. Well, do you know what? That's a success as far as I'm concerned. Sorry, you mentioned something there around confidence. And I, and I wanted to sort of double click on that for a second, if I could, because when we speak about individuals' characteristics, the templates that perhaps would have worked in you know, 20, 30 years ago, when people were perhaps more conditioned with the idea of working in a corporate structure and success for certain people was attached to rate of income and things like that. There's a been a big swing in my personal opinion, and please disagree if you, if you feel, that people are people have a different aspect of work-life balance. And I wonder if there is as much of an appetite in general for things like promotion i think people will have an appetite for development but i think some people look at that more laterally and look to do different things with their life which perhaps doesn't doesn't always suit uh, or doesn't always walk hand in hand with the old approach and, and also that aspect of confidence you know we mentioned there around social media i feel like certain individuals or i'm not just going to point out i just think a large a larger proportion now do struggle with things like confidence with self-belief so do you feel there is as much of an appetite for people to develop through services you know I, I speak with a number of the people who romantically say some of the most enjoyable times they've had in their career is in that firefighting you know, sub-officer crew leading firefighter whatever it might be and and i do you know and perhaps not as, as many as yourself of course but i do engage with a number of people at senior leadership teams who find existing at that level very difficult and my concern is is how much of that is putting people off from wanting to develop? Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, again, it's fascinating. Look at culture of organisations. If you have a police officer that used to retire after 30 years and they were a police officer, they were a bobby on the beat. They used to go, God, you know what? He was a bobby on the beat for 30 years. Fantastic. God, what a difference that person made. Then you get people in the fire service who retire after 30 years as a firefighter and lots of times the culture and the comments was, yeah, I never really understood why they didn't go for promotion. Well, maybe they didn't go for promotion because A, they didn't want to, but also they were a fantastic firefighter. And I used to say as a chief fire officer, I need 30 year firefighters. Mm -hmm. I need those firefighters that can impart their experience and their knowledge into the new people. I want 30 year firefighters who are fantastic role models who individuals, when they join, aspire to be like them. However, that doesn't mean to say that you don't continue to develop within your existing role. And yeah. as we all know, you know, you've only got to look at, you know, um, the way that manufacturing industries change over the years. You can see how much the fire service has changed over the years. When I think about you know, when I first joined and the complexity of the equipment compared to the complexity of what we're dealing with now, when you look yeah. at all the specialisms, urban search and rescue, fire investigation skill, you name it. We, the organisation is incredibly different. It's permanently moving. Mm. And so the challenge actually is not whether you want to be promoted. It's whether you can maintain your competencies and increase your skill base within the rank or the role that you're currently in and, mm. and again and you know i know we're here you know to talk about practice to progress but you know one i'm talking to one service at the moment and they they don't want to have any support around promotion they don't want to support around assessment centers what they want support around is they've got a whole bunch of individuals in the organization that have recently been promoted to station officer level station command level and they don't know how to write a report 
They don't know how to yeah. do a paper for a senior team. They don't know how to do a discipline investigation correctly. They don't know how to write that report associated with that discipline investigation. They don't understand how they're to do a briefing around things like a grievance or or some form of dispute. They're they're not quite sure how they go about having a difficult conversation within the workplace. I'm so glad I didn't interrupt you just then because that's what I was going to ask you is literally what so why help me there and I don't know if it's because maybe I'm a little bit on some kind of spectrum but I do see that a lot of people really struggle having uncomfortable conversations and I probably ad nauseum bore people by saying you know you don't you're not a leader for the 364 days a year where you don't have to calibrate sometimes someone else's behavior and or their expectations and or because ultimately that is the point at which you are the custodian of this thing that you speak so romantically about you know when we say oh i love the job because of xyz well those moments as a manager leader and you know what even just as a fellow firefighter that is the moment because that's what i love most is when i see other firefighters on my watch calibrate for someone that doesn't share their standards or isn't they're demonstrating you know trust or the behaviors that we would like to see in our firefighters but a lot of people don't like doing that and i I obviously haven't been in long enough to say what was happening 30 years ago, but 15 years ago, at least, I don't know that people were ruder. They weren't more abrupt, but they didn't shy away as much from these difficult conversations. And again, I always say that that's one of those soft skills. We like the hard skills. That's why firefighters love talking technical information and the size of this and the weight of that and the the capacity of whatever. But those skills, like you were just saying, around um, interpersonal skills around management, around having difficult conversations. D- could you shine any light on on your, you know, either personal interactions, personal experiences, or why you think we are becoming l- less good? I'm really not doing very well there without my wording there, but we don't seem to yeah. have as much of an appetite to do that, or we're not we're just not as good at it. Do you know what? I'm I'm not quite sure when we lost our backbone. Wrong. Maybe that's a very controversial thing to say, but you know what? I'm going to say it because sometimes in organisations, when you're dealing with an individual, I think what people tend to do now is they try to stretch onto a shelf and pull the policy down as to how they're going to deal with it. Or they'll go to their internet and they'll try and pull a policy down of how to deal with it. Nine times out of ten, on occasions, you know that your head, your heart and your stomach have just lined up and this is the right thing to do. Mm. And actually, let's get some backbone and do the right thing here. And sometimes to call out that inappropriate behaviour. And you use the term there, calibrate. I think that's fantastic. I think it's a brilliant phrase to use. I always talk about resetting, but I think calibration is the right phrase to use. I think if and- I ever have to get out a piece of paper and put it between you and I, then we have failed. Our, our relationship, my ability to build rapport with you has failed. And I and I, I always used to say to the people on my watch, they they would ask about certain things. I'd have to go and check the policy, and it used to drive my station manager mad because I didn't really know half the policies. And it's probably not good. I'm not saying people shouldn't shouldn't check their things, but I was like, I'm going to rely on having a very close relationship with these individuals because if I ever have to wave a policy at you, something has gone horribly wrong. We've let each yeah. other down in our relationship. Yeah, I mean, I think if I was to give you a perfect example of what I'm trying to summarise here, as a chief fire officer. I unfortunately, in my seven years tenure, I unfortunately had to dismiss four individuals in the organisation. Two of those were whole time, two of those were retained on call. I didn't want to dismiss anybody in the UK Fire and Rescue Service or Oxfordshire or anywhere. All I wanted to do was promote people and I wanted to promote the Fire and Rescue Service because it's a fantastic organisation. But those individuals left me with no option but to exit them out of the individual because of their behaviour, some of which was criminal. In one case, it was criminal. In one case, it was fraudulent. So they left me with no option. However, if you unpick the dismissal of the vast majority of that four, if you unpick it, their behaviour and their conduct was identified at watch level. It was identified at station level. There was a reputation or there was some form of rumour going around about it. Well, hold on a minute. Everybody in the organisation has now let that firefighter down. Yes. Because it should never have got to me in a million years. And and that's where I'm talking about backbone, Mm. which is that, you know, if you've got somebody that you know 
is behaving in such a way that it's just not acceptable there's different ways of dealing with it and one way of dealing with it is you go and have a quiet conversation and you don't need to have a policy about that you can say can we just have a chat for two minutes and that might be enough but also you then know that you can take it down more of a formal route Hmm. but if i was to summarize what i'm just saying there pete is that I don't know when we lost the ability or indeed the confidence to be able to say, actually, I'm really unhappy about this. Mm. And and therefore, you can kind of, if you walk past it, you've just set the new standard. You've just yep. set, you've lowered the bar yourself, you know. And now, as the chief bar officer said to me, is what you permit, you promote, isn't it? That, that's, and that's that, exactly it. And it just it really... It really yeah. aggravates me. I've sat on promotion boards at times when someone, you know, and you have to have a management referral to go and sit in that promotion. And some people come so either ill prepared or they demonstrate and communicate some pretty poor values. And I'll go back, you know, sometimes you'll have a quiet moment with the manager that referred them. And I says, how come you put it, you know, him or her or whoever, you know, forward, you know, how, how do you think they were going to get on? They said, oh, yeah, they weren't ready. So to, why, why did you put them forwards or why did you not, why weren't you able to develop them? And they're just like, well, they said they were ready. And I didn't, you know, I, I was worried that if I said they weren't ready or I didn't think they were going to be good enough for it, or they still needed to develop on this, you know, it's kind of like, oh, I didn't have any, um, I didn't have any clout or I, I, I was worried they were going to say that I'm bullying them or worrying that I'm holding it against them. And that's, that's kind of my frustration of fear because you've got to have an environment of safety for people to be able to have these conversations. And if we're constantly worried about an accusation or repercussions of trying to give somebody feedback, you know, then, uh, then we collectively we're doing each other a disservice and it can become a cyclic downward yeah. spiral. And that, and that we're, that's not everywhere. You know, these are just a couple of examples I've had in the past and, and I, it just upsets me, you know, yeah, and I, I, I get that. And I think, you know, if you were to hand on heart, how many people do you know who have had a reference from their line manager as to whether they're ready to go for promotion where the line manager said no? Yeah. You know, the vast majority say, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, why? Yeah. Because actually it's just the easy route to take. Oh, now, I think no. actually we're becoming a bit more scientific <laughs> about this now. I think we're, you know, we're moving away to values-based promotion. We're yeah. moving away from... Can you tell me the procedure of how I get from A to D? We're moving away from all of that and we're moving towards your behavioural set. We're moving towards your values. We're moving towards how you as an individual would live the values of this organisation, how you will manage this organisation in a better, more ethical, more value driven way through your behaviours. And that's so true because we speak about it we speak about the challenges in the cultural reviews and stuff in the, in the, and then we speak about our values and then we focus we go how do we fix this and we focus on a policy or we have done in the past yeah. Yeah. whereas i'm a big advocate and I, and I bore people to death i'm sure with this aspect of 360 feedback which i've used in so many different organizations before coming to the fire and rescue service and only now do i see it coming in in so many areas of this because that allows for a more holistic self-awareness to be gifted to somebody from their colleagues from from hopefully several touch points within the organization versus just those those older metrics like you were referring to of tell me how to do this policy mm. or tell me how you know and that 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 wasn't what we said we were struggling with we said we were challenged with yeah. values culture and people feeling valued and fulfilled and developed in their role so so it, it's great to hear that that yeah. is that is that is a big part of this i know it's a big part of this yeah and, and i certainly think that's the direction of travel that's going in but but also i just I'll just kind of sew another kind of question, really, and then I'll follow up with an answer myself. Please but do. If you, were to, if you were to kind of ask yourself the question, how confident are you, and I'm not asking you to answer this, yeah. but how confident would you be of going to your line manager tomorrow and actually saying to them, do you know what, I'm really struggling with this. I can't get my head around this. This is not something I feel confident in doing. Culturally, we will struggle to do that within the fire and rescue service. We're getting better at it. But culturally, there is a big thing about people putting their head above the parapet and saying, I'm struggling with this. But just look at the amount of magnificent progress there's been within the FRS sector around mental health. And yeah. actually, it's not a big deal to say, do you know what, that incident really got inside my head and I think I need to talk this through. It's not a big deal anymore. 
that's great. That's that's a good example of where the culture of the sector has moved on in a really, really positive way. But when it comes to things like promotion, when it comes to things like assessment, when it comes to things like a value based interview, because a lot of this is new to organisations, it's new to individuals. Again, what practice to progress can bring to organisations and individuals is that the vast majority of work that we do is all online. It's all done via MS Teams. It's It can be recorded. That recording stays with the individual who, if you like, is the client, the candidate and the leadership facilitator stroke assessor. It stays between those two. In other words, the individual is lifted out of their own organisation, psychology, psychologically, lifted out of their own organisation. They're in a really safe space where they can practice, they can fail, they can develop, they can get better in an entirely confidential way. And through that then effective debrief, which can be quite challenging, and actually it's a lot easier to deliver a really effective debrief if you don't necessarily know or work with the individual. So there's a degree mm. of independence on both sides, but it provides that individual with a really safe space to be able to develop and learn. And from that, so for example, we're we're working with, about to start working with one service at the moment where we've developed a really good workbook, which is all based around behaviours and ethics and values. And it really, ch- it's a self reflective workbook and the individual then goes through that workbook that workbook is then debriefed by one of our uh, our team and then they are then looking at what they refer to as a cold interview they go straight into a values-based competency-based interview with one assessor that one assessor then debriefs them period of self-reflection again there's then another assessment that takes place another competency-based interview with p2p This time it's with that original assessor plus one new one. The second interview assessment is then debriefed by the second assessor, but both the video of the first assessment and the second assessment is then compared. The individual can then see the massive improvement journey that they've been on through that development opportunity. You can see their confidence come up. You can see their shoulders go back. You can see the, the smile on their face. You can see the way that they start to construct an answer. You know, where they talk about the situation, they talk about the task, they talk about the actions that they did as a result of it and the results to both them, the individual and the organisation. You know, we help them to structure their thought processes based upon decades and decades and decades and decades of experience of all the team that I pulled together in P2P where we really crashed and burned in interviews, where we got yeah. so <laughs> Mate, I always say to people that I did, uh, I've did. i done 22 processes to get to this watch commander position that I'm in at the minute. It took me about, I think, 13 or so a different crew manager or a leading firefighter wants me to get that. And the amount of times people just said, Pete, they don't like you. Just get the message. You know, someone just needs to have a quiet word with you and say your face doesn't fit. But I was like, there was so many changes going on through different pools and promotion processes and development pathways and different qualifications that we needed and didn't need and all that sort of stuff. But optimistically or naively, one of the two, I always say to people, I'm hopeful that wherever my skill set might may or may not be, what I would like to think is that in retrospect, I can talk to people about that mindset. Because when I was listening to you then, it, so much of what you were saying was speaking to me about the difference between mindset and skill set. Because ultimately, if we can if we can nurture this mindset of openness, transparency, and being willing to to try and fail and, and, and try again, that's going to ultimately make for a healthier workplace of a learning culture. Because I always say the podcast is like learning out loud because the, the the testament that this even exists is a nice indicator of where we are moving to, I think, because I wouldn't be able to get away with something like this 15 years ago, you know, coming on and getting stuff wrong constantly, misquoting people, getting, you know, getting my, you know, ass wrapped around my head because I kept getting things wrong. This wouldn't have been able to exist back then. And it's a, it's an indicator that we are much more trusting and that we're much more willing to help let people express themselves and learn and make mistakes and fail because I don't think we were there in the past. But one thing I did want to ask you when I was hearing you speak then is because when I do truly believe that mindset can sometimes be more advantageous than skill set, this is where I start seeing the entry of things like direct entry. So uh, 
us as an organization or us as a sector being more willing to recognize the skill sets of people entering our sector because even like we use the example of when we spoke about some of this coming from policing if you said that to certain firefighters and said this framework's come to policing they would go what the hell do they know about firefighting it's obviously not going to work for us it's not for us and that with the greatest of respect just screams of the fact that we're, we're 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 leading we're managing whatever we're trying to develop people and the beautiful thing about people is they exist everywhere so many of the challenges that we will be facing are not unique to the fire service our skill set will be unique absolutely but at certain levels of the organization your skill set isn't always the most relevant thing it's how you are working with the people around you and that's that's in my mind what i see when i hear you speak about ethics and values and the way that we treat and develop different diverse people because that's not about skill set at all that's about people having the right mindset hey folks just wanted to jump in with a quick piece around firefighter health and well-being whether you are trying to join the fire service and pass them tricky fitness tests if you are currently serving or if you are coming up to that next chapter of your life retiring from the emergency services we get so many different questions around it. So in partnership with Fitness for the Frontline, we have come up with a series of guidance and programs specifically designed to reflect the physical elements of the role of a firefighter. So whether it's carrying an LPP across an overgrown field, lifting a ladder above your head, under running it, or wrestling with cutting gear for 30 plus minutes at some kind of complicated RTC, our bodies are required to lift, push, and carry objects in very specific circumstances. That is effectively what Fitness on the Frontline focuses on, as well as the longer term aspects of overall health and wellness for our firefighters. Now, we are definitely not about to be smashing out world records or getting that beach body ready in six weeks rubbish. The systems and programs that we put in place are adjusted for people's current fitness levels and they're not a prescriptive weight or a one-size-fits-all BS. It is very likely for myself personally that I'm still going to be a firefighter when I'm 60 plus. So longevity in the role is really important to me. And I know it is for so many people out there. It all starts with no obligation, seven days worth of the programming. Absolutely free. So whether you're joining, serving or looking at the next chapter in your life, Fitness for the Frontline is designed by firefighters for firefighters. Now back to the show. Yeah, no, totally. I mean, again, you know, when, when, you, when you stop and think about opportunities, for development in the UK FRS. I think operationally, we are fantastic. And I've always said and still stand by the fact that I strongly and genuinely and honestly believe that the UK FRS is the best fire and rescue service in the world. I absolutely stand by that. And I've been very fortunate in my career that I've done a bit of traveling, particularly since I've, I've retired and I've seen how organizations operate in other parts of the world. And we are absolutely fantastic. And one of the reasons why we're fantastic is because we're so brutally honest operationally about getting it wrong. You know, when you look at the public inquiry into Manchester, when you look at some of the other public inquiries, Grenfell being another one, not not there, there's very few governments and countries in this world that have a public inquiry. I can agree with you there, because I say when we do the debriefs on the podcast, I actually find it challenging. I like to cover stuff from other countries, but very few of them go into the same level of depth, to be honest you with go. you. And they don't Absolutely. make they don't make for us an effective read because the, the, the title at the end is just everybody did the best they could. And we all try. And I'm like, that doesn't help anyone. Yeah. <laughs> what yeah. was the lesson no, that we learned here? There's no lesson there. <laughs> yeah. So, so you, you come back. You know, if you think about. It doesn't matter whether you're a firefighter, whether you're chief firefighter, whatever. It doesn't matter. The fire service is, is a unique thing. You, I'll, I'll just paint you a little picture here now, which is that you come back from an incident and we have a debrief. We can have a, a hot debrief. We can have a cold debrief, whatever organisations call their debrief structures. And generally speaking, they revolve around a set of questions. What went well? What didn't go so well? What would we do differently next time? And usually that's the framework, isn't it? Yeah, three it things that went much. well, three things that didn't go so well, three things that we would do differently next time. It's amazing how we come back from an incident and the truck or the response car, whatever, whatever the scenario is, gets back to its base station. Those doors come down and then we do that debrief. Yet we may be three or four days until the next incident. And during that three or four days, there's a whole series of managerial interventions that we will be making or a whole series of interventions that a firefighter will be making in their day to day activity at work. But we never stop and ask ourselves what went well off that? Mm. What didn't go so well? 
what would we do different next time? And so it's a shame that we don't bring that professional learning from the operational side into our personal development, into our understanding around culture, around leadership, around value-centered approaches. It's a shame that we separate operational bits and day-to-day -day life bits. You know, if we had that same attitude that every day I want to get better at being a person, every day I want to get better at being somebody who other people work with that's you know, the hardest you... thing though i think that and, and you know what the more i thought about that, i've been thinking about this for months is and i think i think that i'm still sort of structuring this thought as i go through the months and weeks if i forgive you feedback in your operational capacity whilst it is still about you it is about you as an as a as a person in the fire and rescue service for example if i give you personal feedback and this is the thing i have found some people think it is a reflection on them as an individual and the fact that maybe if I if I give you feedback on how how you have addressed somebody or how you have worked with another member of the team or, you know, little thing. I mean, I, and I try and play. I have different versions of this when I'm working with different people. But like, you know, what do you think your impact was on that person? Impact intended versus impact felt. You know, how do you what do you what were you trying to communicate and what do you think got across or, you know, what would what was success in that interaction? Was it that we. You, they listen to you or was it that together you managed to come to a solution and then trying to encourage them to like have a wider spectrum of styles i always talk about flexing styles certainly when people start to move into management and crew and watch manager positions it's about being able to flex your style i always say treat people fairly but don't treat them the same and you do need to be able to take that feedback from the different way that you're working with different people on the watch because they are very different people so don't mm. treat them all the same and i want mm. you to reflect on how you've just spoken to that person or in that group of five individuals you just ran that drill with why was the different levels of success and the easy thing to go is just to say oh it's because that person's better or that person's been in longer now that person hears you differently or that the way you're speaking the way you're addressing that person but the difficulty to to try and close the loop on this point is that is a reflection on the way you are as a person and then maybe certain people and i've had this as feedback saying well you're saying i'm a bad person and actually i'm not because i'm a good husband or i'm a good wife yeah my kids don't seem to think i'm bad this is just your opinion pete you know actually i don't think i'm abrasive okay well you know and that that's where sometimes the 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 well of conversation can dry up because again i'm probably going over the same point here but it's about those conversations which are all about culture and are all about creating an environment where people want to work with you they want to be there with you rather than avoiding you all day on station absolutely i mean just look at this world this planet there's eight billion people is it maybe more than that these days probably eight billion people that's eight billion people that are all different that's eight billion people that have all had slightly different upbringings have all come from different cultures different backgrounds different dna makeup so why do we think that everybody should be treated the same? Way? There's eight billion different sets of DNA out there. <laughs> yeah. So when, when, and when, and whenever I hear people say, "Well, I always treat people like I like to be treated," well, how do you know that I like to be treated how you like to be treated? That's such a blasé, yeah, kind of most irrelevant statement. I always use love as an now, example here. That's it, because like if if we were in a relationship, and it's an easy one, because I'm like. Okay, if, if I'm with a new partner and I want to demonstrate love to them, okay, the way I think love is, is I'm going to hold your hand and I'm going to kiss you in public because that shows everybody that I love you. You might hate that. That to you, you are not a fan of public displays of affection. You are not a fan of physical contact. Yeah, you're not a fan of talking every two minutes. You may not need to be, you know, appreciated and, and acknowledged every two seconds, but maybe I do because I'm different to you. That doesn't mean you love me less. Yeah. It doesn't mean I love you more, but it's different the yeah. thing is the same, but the way I'm treating you yeah. is different. I apologize for interrupting you, but I, I always think of it in that respect. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And, and and again, you just think about, you think about a fire engine, think about a team on that fire engine. Everybody's got different skills. Everybody's got different strengths. Everybody can bring something to the table. And as soon as that door, the appliance bay door goes up, bang, you've got the most effective team going on that fire engine. They may not necessarily be the most experienced, they may be operationally quite naive, but do you know what? Between the five of them, they're going to pull together and they're going to crack it. Okay. Mm. And we are just think about think about the power that that officer in charge has in this organization. Let me I'll just 
I'm going to go off on a bit of a tangent now. Please so do. You think I'm going, if you think I'm going down the barking mad route, stop me. Let's It'd let's be nice have to a, have some let, company. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> let, 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 let me. Uh, I'm, and I'm going to. I'm going to be sound critical now of my policing colleagues, and I'm sure that if any of those are listening, they'll take it with a pinch of salt. But let let me let me paint a scenario for you. I'm a crew manager going out on a fire engine, and I turn up to an incident. And this incident is a really big, complicated incident. The first thing that I do is I say, I'm declaring this a major incident. As a result of my decision, 10 other fire engines, let's say, I don't know what everybody's major incident mm -hmm. policies are slightly different, aren't they? I'm going to get another 10 fire engines going to come along. I'm going to get a hydraulic platform. I'm going to get a water bowser. I'm going to get a control unit come along. I'm going to have lots of response vehicles come along. Or blah, 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 blah. I've just made that decision. That's cost tens of thousands of pounds, probably hundreds of thousands of pounds. I've made that decision as a first line crew manager, stroke incident commander, first level incident commander. I've just made that decision. And the organisation, I as a chief officer, will be sat at my headquarters. I don't even know that they've, well, no, I probably would know they've declared it a major incident. <laughs> but if they went to make clubs 10, OK, I wouldn't know anything about it unless I was the gold officer on that day. So that's the amazing power that culturally we give to that crew manager. That's an amazing amount of power. Yeah. Now, if I was a PC and I turned up, please constable, and I turned up to a firearms incident and I said, I'm at a firearms incident, I require a firearms officer, that would have to go up the food chain right the way to the senior inspector or chief inspector or whoever in the control room who will make a decision as to whether to mobilise a firearms officer. And then once the firearms officer arrives and they've got this individual in their crosswire and they can take this individual out, they can't shoot until they've asked the decision to go right the way up to the top of the order. So in other words, somebody who is completely remote from the organisation in a control room that might be 60, 70, 80 miles away. It might be five boroughs away from where this firearms officer is about to pull the trigger, makes a decision as to whether they can pull the trigger or not. So when you look at how culturally the fire and police is fundamentally different, hmm. however, where they come together is around behaviour expectations of the public, behaviour expectations internally. And we've seen some horrendous cultural reports come out about policing haven't we we've now seen some horrendous ones come out around yeah. around fire so we've got to do something about it you know and if you think back to where i just started before i went off on this tangent you've got that crew manager with that amazing power where under blue lights they can go major incident under blue lights they can go make pumps 10 they can make a massive, massive decision in the organisation, yet when they come back into that workplace and they start to see something which is slightly inappropriate that they need to nip in the bud, they're not making that decision. And that's where that cultural shift, I think, needs to go. Because, Absolutely. like I say, I dismissed four people. The reality is only two of those should have been dismissed out of the organisation because what those two individuals did was witnessed and identified at a much lower level and it should have been dealt with. The other two where there was fraud and where there was criminality, that's a different matter. That was outside of work and that had a direct impact therefore on trust of the individual. But you know, we, we let ourselves down. We, mm. we can do so much more about this and we can get it right. Mm. You know, and, and I, I hear lots of times about culture and um you know, a friend of mine said, well, I, I wouldn't want my daughter to join the fire service. And I went, oh, you, your daughter's got to join the fire service. It's fantastic. <laughs> no, this is right. Like, and I hear the cross the emergency yeah. services. Like when people say they love the job or people say they hate the job and then they try and talk about it being a, 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 a you know, senior leadership thing or a paid thing or a whatever thing, I'm like, but pay is pretty much the same across the UK Fire and Rescue Service. The kit is pretty much the same. Policies are pretty much the same. So the job is pretty much the same. It's the people. What you've actually just told me is the station and or watch and or small group of people you work with do not 
create an environment that you enjoy because so and so at that station two miles three miles 20 miles down the road loves it and they're in the same organization and wearing the same uniform and the same policy and the same pay yeah so it's the culture that you have in your sphere of control is those things it's the, it's the stoic principle of controlling the controllables people like to moan about things outside of their control but actually how much you enjoy your job or how supported you feel or how how much opportunity you think you have for development is actually well within your sphere of control well within your sphere of control because it's local yeah. it's your team it's your manager yeah. it's your colleagues yeah. it's the people you're with on a day-to-day basis that's his culture yeah you're right i mean culture's fascinating isn't it different organizations slightly different cultures i get that you know, if you look at some of the horrendous stuff that's come out from the house of commons around you know bullying from mps and civil servants behavior blah, blah. there's a there's an issue there then you then you pick up issues in the nhs then you pick up issues in teaching then you pick up issues in the private sector then there's issues in the fire service and there's issues in you know this society in a whole as a whole is going through a very slow revolution so in other words it's it's more of an evolution than a revolution but it's going through a really different sphere of its existence Mm. you know we 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 look at some of the comedy programs that were on television in the (laughs) 70s and 80s and 90s and we go really really (laughs) you know really you know so we kind of so we're we're getting better aren't we 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 you know without a doubt that we're all getting more seeds more questions placed in our minds around actually what should we be doing here and i'd like to think that nobody goes to work to get it wrong now i know some people have always questioned that but the vast majority they don't join the sector they, they, they don't. I don't think they join the sector because they don't go to work with malice. They, they, we're not, you know, I'm not going to cast this, well, I am. I'm going to say things about the banking sector and stuff like that. There's lots of different motivations. If I'm horrible to you at work, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get paid more. Do you know what I mean? If I get one over on you, people don't join the emergency services with those motivations in my person. It's only my personal opinion, but I just, I, I don't think we attract those people. I think th- th- those people can can develop and they, they'll have their own reason, their own journey as to why they've made those poor decisions. But I don't believe we are systemically attracting bad people to the job. They're not coming here to destroy mm. the emergency services. And I don't think we've got any of those, mm. I personally think. No, no. And, you know, I mean, you mentioned direct entry earlier on. And, you know, when I when I've listened to civil servants and ministers and they talk about direct entry and they talk about direct entry as a, a really powerful way to change the the diverse makeup of the fire and rescue service and change the culture of the fire and rescue service i'm kind of not so sure i buy that argument to be honest with you i'm not quite sure how maybe getting in 2030 direct entry in the next two or three years is going to fundamentally change the culture i, I kind of don't get that bit you know when you look at 60 70 000 firefighters in the uk i i don't quite work out where the link is and when people say to me well do you agree with direct entry i say yeah absolutely i agree with direct entry you want a perfect example of direct entry it's a member of public coming in as a firefighter there's a perfect example of direct entry i now, agree <laughs> but i i'm also and it would be i think it's probably best place for me to say this rather than yourself only because people wouldn't expect it from me the very the very podcast is an example. I speak to so many people outside of our sector because they have had experiences that I believe tremendously benefit us from getting those insights. That doesn't mean they need to come and join the emergency services and or the fire and rescue service. But I do think that the certain aspects of personal development they're not are not impossible to get in our sector but they're very difficult i came from organizations where there was a tremendous focus on your personal development and often because they were capitalist companies they afforded me the ability to go on certain courses and have certain experiences that that gave me some of the soft skills that i like to think egotistically make me a little bit better at building rapport and creating environments that people actually want to work i don't think that's unique to external sectors but i I do think i would play devil's advocate there and say that there are some people that i mean there's a couple of chiefs at the minute um who's the female chief who i spoke to women in the fire service i forgive for forgetting her name she's written a book on neurodiversity fascinating lady i found her absolutely incredible i think she used to be a manager at i thought she used to work at john lewis or maybe she was a tesco's 
I can't remember. But anyway, I think there's tremendous benefit from be- from some certain people that come in on those direct entry processes. But you think you think there's plus and minuses. But are you just? I mean, so through through things like practice, I guess, are you that supremely confident that these will be some of the missing links that will give us the development that you think we're missing, or that I think we're missing? Sorry. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against direct entry in any way, shape, or form. I think the the richer the the ingredients in the UK FRS, the better the product will be at the end of it. Where my challenge here is, is that I don't consider that by bringing in a potential handful of individuals, it's going to fundamentally change the culture of the UK FRS. No, I yeah, just, yeah. I just it doesn't need fixing that. by an external person. We do have the tools yeah. to do it ourselves. Right. Yeah. We, we, can, we can do it. We are, we, we are in charge of our own yeah. destiny in terms of culture, in terms of behaviour, in terms of value set. We, we can deliver that. You, if you look at, you know, people like Anne Millington, for example, the massive difference, the massive positive difference she's made not only to Kent Fire and Rescue Service, but because she brought in that huge skill base and experience from her previous HR world, working in the private sector, working in the NHS, she's brought all of that in to the mm. UK FRS. And when you look at the national leadership um, framework, the National Fire Chiefs Council leadership framework, that's Anne Millington's piece of work. Now, would we have created something like that without an Anne Millington? We'd have probably stumbled along and got something. Yeah, yeah. we'd have probably we'd have probably Googled something and maybe pulled it down and <laughs> yeah. without that, thank you very much, and we'll shove a badge on it. But because Anne brings that richness of experience, because she brings that sector competence, mm. but what Anne is also very, very good at is recognizing I'm not an operational chief fire officer. But if you do want to be an operational chief fire officer and you've come in from the outside, exactly the same as a member of public coming in to become a firefighter, you need a comprehensive training program. You need a comprehensive development program, because why would you ask somebody to come into an organization at station command level or at area manager level? Why would you ask them to come into an organization and give them a massive hill that they've got to climb? Yeah, You know, they've already made a decision to come into an organization, direct entry. That's a big, bold decision. Mm-hmm. They already know that they're coming in to an organization called the Fire and Rescue Service, which I'm sure they've done a bit of research around and recognize that it's got its own challenges like every other sector has. Mm-hmm. But surely we have a moral obligation and I would argue a moral duty to make sure that if we do direct entry at various other levels, then we've got to do it right and we've got to do it properly. And if we do it right and we do it properly, it can lead to that real richness coming into the sector. And again, from a practice to progress perspective, we are having conversations at the moment about how we can help support people who are coming in at direct entry level above that firefighter. And let's not forget, you know, members of public come in, as firefighters that's a great example of direct entry Mm. what do we do with our firefighters we've got a really comprehensive program for them Mm. we've got great instructors that spend time imparting their knowledge imparting their experience we place them on a program where they have an opportunity over a period of time to develop their competence therefore they develop their confidence etc etc we've got great programs in position We need to do the same elsewhere if we're going to move to direct entry. Otherwise, we bring people in with a massive, massive hill they've got to climb, and then we chuck a load of gravel on it to make it even harder. So if we're going to do it, we've got to get it right. And I think that's my kind of plea around it, really. I I agree. And I I just want to try and close that point, just add my two pence on something there, is that I think where direct entry sounds good, and this is just my opinion, you haven't got to give your thoughts on this unless you want to, I think it's safe at maybe area manager and above. I think from people I've spoken to, there is a there is a fear and a danger that if you put a station manager direct entry, they're like, you're going to kill someone. You don't know what you're doing, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually, you know what? I can We, we know already you can develop those skill sets and a risk template and, and you know understand situational awareness in probably a six-month, you know, eight-month gap, whatever, if you're shadowing people and you're doing it right. But if we're bringing an area manager and above, I think there's tremendous benefits of, of utilizing the diverse skill sets they have from outside the organization. But to add to your point, we already have great direct entry when you see people in their 20s and 30s just coming in from public sector uh, or private sector, sorry, coming into the public sector. But what we don't do with them, which does annoy me, is 
we ignore all of their other skills sometimes. We go, you're joining as a firefighter. Don't care what you know about anything else. I'm going to treat you like an idiot in certain organizations, and I'm just going to treat you like a firefighter. What I am seeing, which I really like, is a number of opportunities for people at firefighter and LF crew manager positions who have the ability to contribute to other parts of the organization without necessarily having to go through progression. You see some great stuff in in health and wellness, in mentoring and coaching, in also part-time instructor roles where you don't have to be a crew manager. You have to, you know, that's where I think we are getting better at appreciating people have a variety of skill sets that doesn't mean they want to get a promotion. Whereas equally uh, accepting people at direct entry is noticing that even though they haven't got the firefighter skill set, they still have other diverse skills that we can benefit from. I'm not sure if that adds any value to what we were just discussing, but that's my kind of two pence on, on, on the direct entry aspect of things. I did want to ask you um, before we close, because I'm conscious of time, is this aspect of how long or how embedded or how in detail is something like this going to be? So you've had a number of interest and or success with certain organizations already, and you spoke kind of the, the you outlined and sketched a framework for how you work, how you're working and supporting with people inside these organizations. Is this intended to be like an apprenticeship type thing? Is it something you work with people over six months, six years? How would this look practically? If there's any organizations which are completely unfamiliar with how this looks, what would it look like inside their service? Okay. Um, yeah, you asked some great questions there. And I'll just kind of um, summarize, if I may, which is that this is a unique partnership. Okay. And the vision of this partnership is to become the long-term trusted partner of choice for the UK FRS concerning recruitment, selection, workforce development, and succession planning support. That's our vision. This is about helping services to continuously improve through workforce cultural change and development. It's about building people's confidence through a fantastic experience with P2P that's delivered in a really convenient way. Fire Knowledge, if you look at Fire Magazine, it's been around since 1908. Wow. I'm sure it will be around in 2108. And so I'm sure will AFSA. And so I'm sure will Women in the Fire Service. And this partnership is something which we are going to strive to embed right across the UK FRS so that we are that trusted partner of choice for organisations when they're looking to bring to life their succession plan. So one service I'm talking to at the moment, they are saying, well, actually, we think we're going to want this for five years, because when they look at the amount of senior people that have gone, the amount of middle people that have moved up, the amount of watch managers that are now moving into that middle manager area, they've got a massive, massive challenge around moving a huge firefighter base up into crew manager mm. and then a huge challenge about bringing those crew managers on into watch manager. And if you think about it, and this is me putting my chief fire officer's hat, old chief fire officer's hat back on. I used to go to every single recruits course. I used to go to every single uh, on-call uh, basic course and I used to meet everybody joining Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue Service and I used to always ask them to kind of draw a bit of a diagram about the organisation about where the chief is and where firefighters are and nine times no 99 times out of 100 they draw the chief at the top of the organisation and they draw firefighters at the bottom of the organisation I would fundamentally challenge that. And I'd say I'm right at the bottom of the organisation. My job as the chief is to hold the organisation up and to provide it with the right resources, the right people, the right development opportunities, the right technology. My job is to hold the organisation up. Firefighters are at the very top of the organisation because they're the bit that touches the public. Firefighters are there to deliver. They are the ambassadors for the fire and rescue service. You know, I, I always used to say to people that if you think about a fire in somebody's house, it's potentially the biggest catastrophe they've ever had in their lives, where they're seeing their possessions, their photo albums, their jewellery, everything going up in smoke. 
my vision was always around the fact that the fire service turned up and they dealt with it. A year later, that family is going to be back in that house. The insurance will have kicked in, new carpets, new curtains. It'll be decorated. It's got new furniture, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that family will then invite their neighbours round for a thank you meal by the way that their neighbours help them on the night. And I want the conversation of that family to not be talking about how awful the fire was, but to be talking about how fantastic the fire and rescue service is. Yeah. That's that's the vision that I wanted in Oxfordshire. And of course, the only way you can get that is if you've got the right people at the right place at the right time with the right skills and they are confident to go and deliver. And recognising that there's been this massive brain drain, recognising that there's been this massive exodus of people out of the sector, there's been a massive input at the bottom end. That's what Practice to Progress is all about. It doesn't matter whether it's about promotion or whether it's about you progressing within your rank or within your role. It's about an extra pair of hands in a unique partnership to help support the rescue, to help to support the UK Fire and Rescue Service to continue to give that fantastic service to the public. Love it. Absolutely love that. I'll, um, you know, when I was listening to you there, I had to fight my, uh, fight my excitement to interrupt you because I do something very similar, but I actually use an analogy of a tree. Have you ever seen that example given as a tree? No, go on, go for it. Because so people, people would, and and like I'm not going to teach you anything, but you can take this one with you if it's of any use to anybody, but people would do exactly that. They would draw that pyramid. People would call it a pyramid. You know, we're here to serve and we're here to do all that. And I would say, right, now that's a tree and flip it on its head because actually the individual that you perceive to be at the top of this is in fact at the bottom. And they are, if you use the analogy of a tree, they are the structure and the strength and the support they are there to reach out across all the routes to get the nourishment, to get the support, to get everything you need. And then you're up there. You are being battered by the wind. You are being hit by the weather. You are in turmoil and you are only going to get support and nutrients and everything you need from these people. So it's their job to give you everything you need. You are not there to serve them. You are front facing. You're the bit everybody looks at. Nobody looks at their trunk. Nobody cares. It's usually boring and un uninteresting. You are the one out there demonstrating the skills you are the one out there you know drinking in all the sunshine you're the one doing the work so that is the way that i like people to think of it as romantic as that might seem in my head but the trunk and the roots and the soil is where all the support has to come from that's where all the nourishment has to come from but you're the ones out mm. there getting battered by the wind but i anyway. really like that i like that pete and i make no apology about telling you now i'm going to steal that steal and use it, it. <laughs> it's useful i like it i don't uh, i don't like using the term steal i like using the term borrow with pride so i shall Absolutely. borrow that with pride i always tell everybody there's no such thing as an original thought because even though you think you came up with it it will have just come out the ether of your mind from a million different fingerprints from everybody you've interacted with and there's a little yeah. bit of you in there as well Dave, thank you so much for your time tonight. People won't know that we're actually recording this in the evening. So thank you for your generosity. I know we've been um, jumping around in our diaries trying to find a date since probably October, November of last year. So I very much appreciate it. I don't want to um, leave people nice and warm. I've got, I haven't got out of the bath and all excited about developing themselves without somewhere to go. So if people do want to go on and learn a little bit more about this, um, what's the best place for them to sort of find a little bit more? OK, so we've got a, a website which you can go to, uh, which is www.fire.practicetoprogress.com. Or if you want to come directly through to me, just do fire at practice to progress .com, And it will be my pleasure to have a conversation with you and help to uh, develop and enable you to flourish in the career that I absolutely enjoy, too. And Pete, can I just also just say Thanks to you. You do a great job with this podcast. I know you uh, you burn the hours. We're chatting now on a Friday night quite late. And uh, I just wanted to say thanks for the difference you make to UK FRS as well, because together we'll crack it. And it's fantastic. Thank you, my friend. I really appreciate that. And I, I've said it before and said probably even since today, but for me, it's all about learning out loud. I, I realise that my little way of trying to make a difference is that, you know, I, I joined all of this emergency services because I had a conversation at some point in time with an interesting person such as yourself or a firefighter, him, her, whoever it might be. And I feel that not enough of these conversations are making their way into the public. So people are, I, I don't want people to get less excited about what we do because I think it's an incredible thing that we do. But if we don't talk about it and we don't open the public up to what we're doing, 
then we'll create an environment where we do become irrelevant because the world's a busy place. So I want people to fall hell of a hill in love with the emergency services, maybe as much as me or yourself, but at least get a true understanding of what's happening and your ability to uh, sacrifice your ego and to be really open and humble today is a great way of doing that. You know, I've tried to have conversations with certain people and they are not as open as yourself. They're not as uh, free to give their own opinions and they don't come off across as authentic. You know, you've got a wealth of experience and authenticity, but only if you're able to let go of a little bit of that professionalism that can that truly come across. So I thank you for that this evening. Brilliant. You're welcome. Thanks again. Firefighters podcast is put together to develop, inspire, and hopefully even motivate those individuals who have chosen to serve our communities and be part of the first responder family. It's brought to you by myself, operational firefighter Pete Wakefield. If you have enjoyed today's episode and you want to see the podcast continue, please head over to our Patreon page where you can support the ongoing efforts of the podcast. Please hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on whatever platform you're listening to. Please support your emergency services responders, and thank you for listening.